Welcome, 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 everyone. My name is Roxana Vendesu. My pronouns are she, ella. Uh, I'm a descendant of the Quechua people of the Andes. Um, as some of you know, I am the Pax Christi USA's program director. But what you may not know is that I also run a nonprofit called Migrant Roots Media, which uh, focuses on um, talking about the root causes of global migration. And we are very specific about um, uplifting the voices of folks who are migrants, who are children of migrants, and of folks who are trying to not migrate. So folks in their various uh, regions and their various communities around the world who are trying to not migrate. Um, because what we have learned is that uh, the only way to address uh, the root causes of migration is to talk about this issue in, in a, at a global scale, right, with an internationalist lens. And really, um, for me personally, even though Migrant Roots Media, it's a secular organization, to me, um, uh, uh, one of the drivers, of course, is uh, the story of Jesus is uh, following the path of a person who was uh, born under an empire, who was persecuted, who was um, a refugee, um, and who was ultimately murdered by the empire, um, but who did a lot, right, as we know. Um, and so that to me is, is one of my main drivers. I had a lot of um, influences in my life. I, uh, my parents are very political um, and actually because of that, we had to migrate um, a couple of times actually. For me, it was the first time on 93 after a coup by Fujimori in Peru. Um, and I was uh, in the BC area for about a year. And later on uh, in 99, after I also became politically active in my country and um, ended up leaving again. And so that th those are the experiences that have shaped me. Um, and when I started becoming active on the issue of um, migrant justice, uh, I realized that a lot of the voices of people directly affected were not really being considered. Um, the, the, what I saw were uh, this public displays of, um, you know, just bringing in immigrants to tell their sad stories, stories that would make people um, feel, you know, sad about it, feel um, just, you know, uh, almost pity, honestly. And so I started realizing that that actually, even strategically, it's not helpful because we never get to the point of addressing root causes of global migration. And so that's the reason why, to me, it became really important to uplift those voices. Um, and I try to do it within certain organizations, and I got a lot of pushback. And so what I, what I ended up doing, of course, was um, starting to conceptualize this idea and, um, and just go for it and just create a new platform. And so I am going to share with you um, my screen and just briefly um, share the website that we have created. I work with um, other folks also, part of the team here, um, who are really amazing people. Um, if you can see my screen there, there we go. So this is Migrant Roots Media. Um, we have, uh, this is a platform, right? A multimedia platform. So we try to publish articles, uh, poetry. Um, we also would like to start creating videos. We, so all types of media um, that can talk about our stories, our um, content that we want to um, include here. And so I will, uh, I will also show you our, team because I think that is important this is our chief editor whom with I edit every single piece that we get um, and uh, the policy director we have a higher education director um, and then we have a couple other new people actually who didn't make it to this to this roster yet but um, we have a person who looks into um, issues of climate climate change environmental uh, justice 
and uh, another editor, because we are getting a little busier now, uh, and also a board of directors that is really representative of uh, many places around the world. Um, and so we have folks from Vietnam, from Nigeria, Mexico, um, I believe uh, Taiwan, um, in Bangladesh. And so just wanted to share this with you because um, this, is, this is the home, the other home that I have. Um, and so to me, it's really important to, to share this. Um, the way I would like to facilitate this space for us is um, a conversation, because I know that many people here in the space uh, have questions. A lot of people here in the space um, hear, you know, all these narratives that are not helpful and they honestly makes you feel frustrated at the end of the day, because you don't know what to do. Um, and so let's dissect those questions and let's hear from folks who have uh, had this experience in the past. Um, our, one of our guests today is a person who, uh, let me just pull up my introduction here. Um, her name is Nahida Halabi Gordon. Uh, she's a professor emerita of statistics and currently serves on the boards of Friends of Sabil North, Palestinian Christian Alliance for Peace and embrace the children of Palestine. She served as senior Fulbright scholar at Bursit University, Palestine, and is a founding member of the interfaith community for peace in the Middle East. A lifelong Presbyterian, Professor Gordon is a church elder, elder and served on several Presbyterian Church USA committees. Born in Jerusalem, Nahida Gordon is a Palestinian American who, ha who was driven from her home during the 1948 Palestinian Nakba. Her book, Palestine is Our Home, Voices of Loss, Courage, and Steadfastness, is an expression of our passion for peace and justice for the people of Palestine. In addition to extensive professional publications, Professor Gordon has published articles on Palestine, Indy Electronic Intifada, Mondois, Counterpunch, and in Unbound. Um, and I would love for, for, uh, for Nahida to share some words with us because um, I think it's important to connect the, the topic of uh, forced displacement to what's happening in Palestine. Um, and so just let me find her uh, so I can, um, let's see, so I can spotlight her. And Nahida, if you are there and you can unmute yourself, it's usually a little easier to find you. There we go. No, where are you? Let's see. There we go. I found you. Let me let me pin you there. All right. Thank you so much for being here, Nahida. I will uh, leave you the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roxanne. And uh, I want to thank you for the nice introduction and thank Pax Christie for the opportunity to speak to all of you. Um, I, I hope in, in the last few minutes, I put together a presentation. I hope it's what you want to hear. Uh, the issue of Palestine and refugees and displaced persons is very huge. And I hope I picked up the right uh, topics uh, for you to look at. Uh, the subject is personal to me um, because um, I'm one of the original 800,000 Palestinians who were displaced from their homes uh, in early 1948. And this occurred uh, because of the United Nations uh, recommendation to partition Palestine and the ensuing fighting and the creation of the State of Israel. Uh, we Palestinians called 1948 the Nakba which is Arabic for catastrophe. Um, and the numbers I give you, the, the 800,000, do not include uh, the internally displaced uh, Palestinians, what the Israeli government likes to call the present absentees, which is sort of ridiculous, uh, but that's what they call them. And you'll see uh, in a few more minutes exactly why they use that term. The tactics used to expel the Palestinians differed by the urban or rural areas. In 1948, I lived in Jaffa, which is one of the oldest cities in Palestine, 
has a history spanning more than 5,000 years. And uh, one of the reasons we, my father took his family out of Palestine was that the Israelis were bombarding these cities and uh, with either bombs from uh, cannons or they'd come down our street and they'd shoot randomly down the street. Uh, so one night, uh, the bomb fell across the street and hit a church, the Church of St. Simon, and my father decided it was time to go for safety. And then, of course, we were never allowed to return. I'll, I'll come back to that uh, uh, problem later on. Now, in the villages, things were a little bit different. Um, Abu Salman Abu Sitte, in his book, The Atlas of Palestine, described in detail the war crimes perpetrated by the Zionist forces against the Palestinian civilians. Uh, he describes the tactics in great detail, uh, listing which military forces were used, the date, the locality, the battalion, and so forth. Here's what he had to say. The pattern of expulsion was consistent throughout, regardless of the region, the date of the particular battalion, which was which attacked the village. Most serious research and all or, oral testimonies given at different times by refugees from different regions of Palestine confirm the same pattern. After the villages attacked and conquered, whether it is resisted or it surrendered, the curfew is imposed. Sometime later, probably by the following morning, the villagers were gathered in the main square or nearby field in separate groups. The men aged 15 to 50 by themselves and the women, children, and the old men by themselves. The village was surrounded from three directions, leaving the fourth open for escape or expulsion. The gap, the gap left open was pointing towards Lebanon or Syria in the Galilee region, which is the north of Palestine, and towards the West Bank and Jordan in the central Palestine, and towards Gaza and Egypt in the south. The women were stripped of their jewelry and valuables in order to walk towards the gap or open gate. Without looking back, shots were fired over their heads to encourage their flight. There have been cases of rape, enslavement, and murder. The men were lined up by a hooded man for review. Very frequently, selected young men were taken in groups of four, ordered to dig their graves, and then they were shot and thrown in the dug pits. Sort of reminders of a lot of what happened to uh, the Jews by the uh, Nazis. I want to give you an, an actual example, it's a heartbreaking example of this expulsion. This was experienced by a young woman. She was around 18 years old. Her name was Amna Bennett, and she's known by her honorific Um Aziz because her oldest son was called Aziz. Her experience is narrated in my book, Palestine is Our Home. In 1948, she was separated from her family while fleeing her village, which came under heavy Israeli mortar fire. Maziz ran out of with the village barefoot, carrying her two infant daughters in a metal washtub on her head. The one month old baby was severely injured by shrapnel during the escape, and tragically, both girls died during the journey out of Palestine. After the upheavals of the Nakba, most of Maziz's family managed to stay in Palestine and became uh, internally displaced refugees in the newly created state of Israel. But Omar Aziz says she crossed the border into Lebanon and wasn't allowed to return, contrary to international law. She joined the columns of displaced refugees and uh, made her way into Lebanon. Her husband found her over a year later and they settled in al Barajne refugee camp on the outskirts of Beirut where they had eight more children. Four of her boys were taken from home and armed by and her arms by Lebanese Falange forces during the Sabra and Shatila massacre in September 1982. This was during the time when Israel had attacked southern Lebanon. They were never seen again. 30 years afterwards, they disappeared. She still thinks they are going to come back. She sits by her window and waits to hear them come back. I will say that goes on to describe massacres uh, and so forth, but I won't, uh, since that's out of the purview of this talk, I won't go over that uh, at this point. The next largest dislocation of Palestinians occurred during and after the June 1967 war 
when Israel took control of the rest of Palestine. This was the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip, uh, and the Sinai Desert. This war caused a, uh, a dislocation of an estimated 250,000 Palestinians. The United Nations Security Council passed Resolution 242, which you probably hear a lot about in the news. And this was a very important uh, uh, resolution. It requested the withdrawal of Israeli forces from conquered territories, and, and it also requested that the refugees be allowed to return or be compensated if they don't want to return. This has not been implemented to this day. So what happened to the Palestinian diaspora? With time, since 1948, these, the numbers have grown with, with their children and descendants. The Palestinians who remained in Israel were driven from their villages, became internally displaced. Indeed, rather than allowing these displaced persons to return to the land and villages, the Israeli government declared them to be present absentees, which is a ridiculous term. It's, you're present and you're absent at the same time. And under a law which they passed, called the absentee property law, they proceeded to confiscate, confiscate their lands. Since they were absent, they couldn't take their lands, so they took the lands. And in Jaffa, the city where I was living in, there were 5,000 Palestinians left. They managed not to escape. They were rounded up and placed within a compound encircled by barbed wire, and then they were declared absent. And so therefore their properties were confiscated. Now, obtaining accurate estimates of where the worldwide numbers of Palestinians is difficult. However, some estimates do exist. In 2008, the Palestine Central Bureau estimated there were 10.3 billion Palestinians worldwide. Of these, the United Nations Relief Works Agency, UNRWA, which by the way is the only UN agency which is dedicated to uh, the, the, the uh, help to one single group of refugees and Palestinians. UNRWA estimates 4.7 million are registered refugees. Now what's a registered refugees? You note that leaves uh, over 5 million who are not registered. The definition of a registered refugee is a person whose normal place of residence was Palestine between June 1946 and May 1948, who lost both their homes and means of livelihood as a result of the 48th Arab-Israeli conflict. Under that definition, I am eligible to be a refugee. However, I had to be in a certain place at a certain time to register. And so therefore I'm not registered. So to be eligible for the UNRWA service, you have to be registered. And UNRWA estimates that they're around, uh, that early in 1950, they took care of 750,000 refugees and then 64,000 more, 140 persons uh, became refugees in Jordan and an additional 240 uh, were displaced inside the West Bank. And there are around maybe, this is very rough estimate, maybe two, three or 400,000 Palestinians living worldwide who are not registered, obviously. Now, in any conflict, when the uh, hostilities are ceased and they're over, refugees are allowed to return. In the case of Palestine, that has never happened. The right of return to the, your country of origin is a customary right and has origin in several sources. And most of the important is the international law. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, UN General Resolution 194, and the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights. So clearly, the right of return of refugees is granted under accepted practices and is firmly anchored in international law. However, I am not allowed to return to, to Israel. If I were Jewish and born in the United States or anywhere in the world, never having set foot in Palestine, I could return and I would be welcomed with open arms. But since I'm Christian, I'm not allowed to return to the land of my ancestors. Okay, so that's the historical context. So what's happening today? Well, the Nakba, which is the, the word catastrophe, is still going on to this day. It's not occurring in large numbers all at once, it's occurring slowly, drip, 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 drip. So Israel is using different tactics to rid itself of the Palestinian people inside the occupied Palestinian territories. That's the Gaza Strip, the East Jerusalem, and the West Bank. They use different tactics in different places. 
the United Nations Office of the Coordination for Humanitarian Affairs, UN OCHA, they, uh, if you would sign up on their website to receive daily reports, you get almost daily reports of what's going on in Israel, who's been shot, who's been wounded, who's been displaced, and so forth. And I'll cite just a few of those for you. On July 14 of this year, the Israeli authorities confiscated 49 structures, including homes, animal shelters, solar power systems, in addition to water tanks, tractors, and animal fodder in the Bedouin community of Ras al near Ramallah. 13 households comprising 84 people, including 53 children, were displaced. Now, why are they picking on Ras al a, a, a tactic that the Israelis have been using really ever since the early part of the 20th century is when they, you see a large uh, urban area, such as, for example, Ramallah, they ring Ramallah with, with settlements so that Ramallah cannot grow. And uh, Ras uh, is a little village on the outskirts of Ramallah. And so they do their best to try and vacate these areas and put settlements in their place. Uh, in Gaza, uh, this is the same report from Ocha in July 14, there were 8,220 internally displaced uh, people called IDPs. They either remain uh, with host families or they, rent, they manage to rent somewhere. Another bulletin from Ocha in June of this year, they demolished and forced people to demolish. Notice they forced you to demolish their home, your home, uh, or seized 91 Palestinian owned structures across the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. This resulted in the displacement of another 108 people, including 62 children, and otherwise affected the livelihoods. 2,700 uh, others. All these structures were located in what is called the Area C or in East Jerusalem, and they were targeted for, for lacking building permits, which are nearly impossible to get. To obtain a permit, you have to fill out an application, and the application must be accompanied by a large fee, usually several thousand shekels, which translates to maybe one or two thousand dollars, which is very prohibitive. And the, the permit is almost certain to be rejected. So people under pressure with growing families, they may add a room or uh, add a little wing to their house. And, and that gives Israel the right to uh, destroy their home because they don't have a permit. So far in 2021, the proportion of structures demolished by the owners in East Jerusalem following the insured issuance of a demolition, demolition order reached 45%, up from the previous year of 27%. So if a resident refuses to demolish their own home, Israel comes in, demolishes it, and then has the temerity to send the family a bill for demolishing their home. Now, from a statement by Lynn Hastings, she's the, the coordinator, humanitarian coordinator of OCHA for the, the Occupied Palestinian Territory. She is talking about a specific area called Hamza al bakah uh, Israeli forces blocked access of humanitarian personnel to the families. When they managed to access the community after the demolition, they found tents, food, water tanks, and fodder had all been destroyed or confiscated, leaving people, including children, out in the open in summer heat with virtually no basic provisions. Even milk, divers, clothes, and toys had been taken. This, unfortunately, is typical. And if you've ever been in Palestine in the summer, uh, it can very be very hot, very dry, and without the right resources, per, death can ensue very easily. Uh, a summary from OCHA, uh, which was put out in 2014, this is all the numbers are greater right now. Uh, they estimate that between 2008 and 2014, 3,299 structures were destroyed and approximately 6,000 people were displaced. And some people experience multiple home demolitions. Some human rights groups come in, they rebuild their house for them, Israel comes in and, and takes it down again. This happens over and over again. So demolitions are just one tactic used by Israel to encourage the Palestinians to leave their homes. Uh, they make their life miserable. There are other tactics. The United Nations, Nations Secretary General, uh, who's a representative on human rights for the IDPs, identified nine triggers for displacement. 
eviction and land appropriation. They use all kinds of reasons to evict you from your land and take your land. So if they build a road, for example, they clear half a kilometer on each side of all property of Palestinians. The military incursions and clearing operations, illegal expansion of settlements and related infrastructure, illegal construction of the separation, a separation wall, which is deemed illegal under international law. And this is a huge subject. I, I wrote a paper on this uh, about what happens to people in what is called the seam zones between the, uh, the, the uh, borders of the West Bank and the wall, which is built within the, inside the West Bank. And the people stuck in between have a terrible time. Uh, there's violence and uh, from settlers. There's a revocation of residency rights. This is especially in Jerusalem. What they're trying to do in Jerusalem, they want to Judaize the city. So they want to reduce the number of Palestinians and they use all kinds of tactics to, to let them uh, leave. Or if you happen to, to go away to school uh, in another country, you may not be allowed to return. Uh, there are discriminatory denial of building permits as we just, uh, I just explained. And uh, a system of closures, restrictions on the right of freedom of movement, such as permits and checkpoints. Quite often, if you want to go to the hospital, the, the main tertiary care hospitals for the West Bank were the Bakasid and the uh, Augusta Victoria in, in Jerusalem, in East Jerusalem. And so for somebody in the West Bank to travel, if they have something seriously really wrong with them, to travel all the way from their house or home in the West Bank to Jerusalem is almost impossible. There have been cases where women have given birth in taxis waiting at checkpoints and people dying of heart attacks while they were waiting. In the Gaza Strip, the military operations, and you've heard of, of uh, almost uh, every three or four years, there's a big uh, uh, campaign of bombing by Israel and that has caused a lot of waves of displacement. And the Norwegian Refugee Council, and there's some numbers here, there are now at least 260,000 internally displaced people in the occupied Palestinian territories as of September 2014, and this number is found to be larger by now. And this has been going on and on and continues to this day. So for a durable solution, a resolution of the injustices inflicted on Palestinians since 1947, and the ongoing occupation of Palestinian territories, including the blockade of the Gaza Strip, must occur. And the culture of impunity for Israeli perpetrators of human rights violations must be ended. The international community, in particular the US government and most European countries, must stop their hypocrisy. They decry what Israel is doing to the Palestinians, yet they protect it in the United Nations Security Council. The majority of the vetoes passed in the UN Security Council are cast by the US government to shield Israel's horrific human rights violations. Finally, I will end with this long description by mentioning some late developments on the diplomatic front. Michael Link, the Canadian academic and UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in the Palestinian territory, occupied since 67, asked the nations of the world to classify the Israeli government practice of sponsoring Israeli squatters on Palestinian owned land on the occupied Palestinian West Bank as a war crime under the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Note that this addresses only human rights violations and crimes only since 1967. It doesn't even bother to mention what happened in 47 to 48 and 49. He called the Israeli set squatters the engines of Israel's 54 year old occupation, the longest in modern world. He explained that for Israel, the settlements serve two related purposes. One is to guarantee that occupied territory will remain under the Israeli control in perpetuity. The second purpose is to ensure that there will never be a genuine Palestinian state. These are exactly the reason why the international community agreed to prohibit the practice of settler implementation when it created the Fourth Geneva Convention and the Rome Statute in 1998. So in other words, bringing uh, settlers from Israel proper into the West Bank is illegal under international law. And the UN High Commission on Human Rights notes there are now close to 300 settlements in occupied East Jerusalem and the West Bank with more than 680 Israeli settlers. Link pointed out that the legality of the Israeli squatter settlements is the most settled issue in international law. In other words, it's obviously illegal. He added, it is a tragic paradox 
that while the Israeli settlements are clearly prohibited by international law, the international community has been remarkably reluctant to enforce its own laws. Link uses the word paradox. I would rather say it is hypocrisy. Since the leading colonial powers preferred to side with Israel's settler colonial enterprise there, the, rather than abide by international law. There is much to be said, and uh, I'll be glad to talk about this more in the question and answer period. And thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you so much, Nahida. Um, you know, this is a, this is such an important topic to talk about with when talking about force displacement. And I can imagine that there are many people who, you know, we're going to, we're thinking about this space as a space that was going to just talk about the, the you know, the, the things that are um, happening to folks in Latin America, right? But like, if we don't start connecting the dots, if we don't start really talking about this global for systemic forces that are causing this force displacement all over the world, then we'll never really truly address the root causes, right? We'll keep getting what I call band-aids. Um, for folks here, you know, looking for uh, residency, which people need it, obviously we should do it, um, but let's do that work along with addressing the reasons why people are being displaced, right? Like, yes, people need driver's licenses in the US and in many other countries in the world. Um, they need uh, work permits, they need residency, they need citizenship and whatnot. But honestly, at the end of the day, the majority of migrants will say, I would have loved to stay in my community. I would have loved to, to stay with my family. We have the right to not migrate. Yes, for sure. And, and a, a lot of times that part of the conversation is left out. And all we focus on are narratives that talk about, you know, the good immigrants and why we, are, we deserve, you know, the papers because we are hard workers and we contribute to the economy. However, very conveniently, those narratives leave out the fact that a lot of uh, US foreign policy actually creates the reasons why people have to leave their communities to begin with. And so that, that, this is the threat here that I want to make very clear for everyone in this space that, you know, and the reason why uh, this, this knowing the struggle of uh, Palestinian peoples are, is so important, it's so critical, like ethnic cleansing is happening right now. Right, and, and it's happening also in, in communities throughout Latin America, throughout Africa, throughout Asia. Uh, you know, indigenous people of each of these communities are being massacred by these global systems that are, you know, capitalist. Um, I see a hand up and I love that because I really want this to be a conversation. So I'm going to uh, ask Gigi to ask uh, her question. Here you are, and I'm gonna ask you to unmute if that's if that works there. You can click that button. There we go. A quick question. First, Roxana, I really uh, am so pleased for your focus that we look at why people are forced to give up their heritage and everything uh, uh, that is dear and near to them. And I, I look forward to more conversation about that, but I have a quick question for the professor. And that is my ongoing confusion about why we are so angry with Hezbollah. I can remember when Hezbollah won the elections in Gaza, our former president, Jimmy Carter said we should, he was not president at the time, of course, but he said, why don't we recognize this? This was the will of the people. And uh, if you could comment on the political situation of the, just briefly of the Palestinians, uh, Professor. Yes, thank you very much for the question. This happened in 2006. Uh, the Palestinians finally were able to have an election. They worked very hard at it. They were overjoyed and Jimmy Carter uh, foundation uh, actually looked over the, uh, uh, the election and proclaimed it to be free and open and democratic. So what happened is, I think you mean Hamas, not Hezbollah. Hezbollah is I mean Hamas, Hamas, excuse yeah, Hamas. me. Got my uh, H's mixed up. Yeah. <laughs> Hamas is in, was in control of the, the um, Gaza Strip and or actually was quite influential in the West Bank. When I was there in 97, for my Fulbright, 
there are a lot of people who are for Hamas, and some people were afraid to say yes, but the majority on the West Bank were for the PLO. And uh, the Palestinian Authority, which is really a creature set up by the United States and Israel, and that's, that's a whole different subject, uh, controlled the West Bank. The election, Hamas won enough votes that under law, they could form a government and therefore appoint their prime minister. The United States and Israel didn't like that. So they put a lot of pressure on Palestinians, uh, especially through the banking uh, the infrastructure. When, when we were there, we happened to be there traveling, you couldn't cash a check. You couldn't you take U.S. travelers' checks to win cash flows. The United States banks would not do any business with Palestinians. When we traveled, we had to take cash. Uh, people would take the U.S. dollar, the cash dollar. So there was a lot of pressure. And uh, at that point, then there was this division, permanent division between Gaza controlled under Hamas and uh, the uh, West Bank by uh, the uh, Palestinian Authority. Now, Hamas at one point did say they recognize the right of Israel to exist, but generally speaking, they don't really say so. They say they have a right to fight for their independence, which by the way is under international law and the occupied people do have a right. And Gaza is occupied. You can't go in and out. Israel has all the gates closed. Uh, the fishermen are supposed to be able to fish to 24 miles out. They are allowed to fish only three miles out. They get shot at when they do uh, go past three miles. So life is very difficult for people in the, in the Gaza Strip. Uh, and uh, the, the United States, uh, basically, it looks like they do Israel's bidding. Uh, however, that's a complicated issue as well. I don't know if I've answered your question. If you have any more questions. Just that in terms of advocacy, it's appropriate for us to say, we would like to see our government offer more support to Hamas, the legitimate government of Gaza. You know, what, what I would say is that I personally don't like the fact that Hamas throws these rockets at Israel. I think it's counterproductive. Mm -hmm. But, and then when you listen to the news about um, who, this is Anthony Blinken, our Secretary of State, he says, well, we talk to the Palestinians too. When they talk to the Palestinians, their idea of talking to the Palestinians is to talk with uh, the Palestinian Authority. Yeah. Well, the Palestinian Authority is not throwing any markets on Israel. It's Hamas that's doing that. So I, I think the most appropriate thing is to talk with Hamas. You may not like what they're doing, but it doesn't make sense not to talk to them. If you really want a solution, you need to talk to both sides, not just the Israelis. Thank you for that question and thank you for that answer and it's it's true you know we have to also look at what's going on internally right um however there are people who are desperate obviously will think of multiple tactics to address their struggle and respond to that attack right and it, and i'm not trying to justify anything but i'm saying that there is this this drive that needs to be addressed, right? Like the reason why they're being pushed to 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 do things like that. Um, and so, but I see already questions in the chat, I, and I want to bring somebody in that I heard yesterday, and I was uh, very very uh, interested in 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 his story. Um, and if I may, Leo, I will introduce you using your uh, bio from from Fordham. Uh, Professor Leo Guardado grew up in a rural mountain town in northern El Salvador before fleeing to Los Angeles when he was nine. After high school in LA and college in the Bay Area of California, he became a La Salian volunteer in Brooklyn, New York, where he served as campus ministry at Bishop Laughlin High School. An interest in monastic life took him to live in a Trappist monastery in Northern California before completing an MTS in historical Christianity at the University of Notre Dame. A series of pastoral commitments led him to work in Tucson, Arizona with churches, dioceses, and NGOs focused on addressing the needs of persons migrating through the desert wilderness and attempting to survive in the US. The experience in the borderlands was a catalyst for pursuing his PhD at the University of Notre Dame in a joint program between the theology department and the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. His ongoing research on human displacement and its challenge 
to the church and its theology is informed by the multidisciplinary lenses necessary for addressing the critical issues of our time. And let me bring Leo to our space here. Um, and I'm not gonna let Nahida go because I think everything interconnects, but I really would love to hear from you, Leo. Um, just uh, 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 when I read about your background um, yesterday about um, your, your story of migration, I, I got really interested because a lot of people tend to leave that out, tend to just stick to, oh, well, this is what I'm doing now. And that sort of doesn't matter, right? But these are experiences we know sh that shape us. And so, um, and I think many people in this room are very familiar with what happened in El Salvador. Um, and so I would just like to hear from you uh, about your own story of migration, if as much or as little as you'd like to, to share with us today. Sure, um, thanks for bringing me into the space and for anyone listening there, uh, this is unplanned, so I don't have a presentation. I presented yesterday before the conference began on sanctuary and the Roman Catholic Church, um, which is the focus of my research. Um, yes, so thank you, Rixana. And let me just, I'll just speak about a few minutes then about my own uh, story, which I know all of this ties into with uh, your vision of the organization that you work with. Um, so I was born in Chalatenango in uh, northern part of El Salvador in 1981. If you're familiar with El Salvador's history and its in or its relationship with U.S. foreign policy, they're very closely uh, tied historically for many, many reasons, really starting in the 1950s. Um, but by 81, when I was born, the war had officially begun, which kind of started in 80. You know, our Bishop Romero had been killed, the U.S. church women, um, you know, were, were killed, you know, the Jesuits in 1989. So the 80s until the early 90s, really till 92, it's a civil war that breaks out. So I grew up in that context, um, and when I was about to turn 10 in 91, my uh, mom said, we need to get out of here. Um, children were conscripted, you can say, to both to the army and to the guerrillas. Um, really, you know, you hit puberty when you're, you know, uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Um, and although conscription age was officially, I believe, 12 during the war, they would really take them earlier. So mom was afraid that I would get, uh, that I would be taken by either side. Um, although in our area, really, it was a guerrilla who probably would have if, if that would have happened. So we migrated north. We got on a bus at 5 a.m. in early October of 91. And um, kind of that bus took us out of the borders of the country. And, um, you know, I said bye to my grandfather, whom I never saw again, and other relatives. And just all I knew was I was going north. Um, I had two words in my English vocabulary that my mom knew because she had spent four and a half years in LA uh, during the 80s. So I had stayed with my aunt there while she was gone. And those two words were thank you and I'm sorry. And she never learned English and to this day she has not learned English. So this was the vocabulary that I brought, I guess, into the US. Um, and so it took us about a month to get to the border, uh, Tijuana. And that journey was uh, filled with a lot of walking, mostly under the moon um to avoid being seen um we were not part yesterday i talked about sanctuary movement and the underground railroad a bit and uh we, we did not tap into any of the international networks of sanctuary churches that were trying to get refugees out from central america from el salvador guatemala we had a coyote from our town we were part of a group of about 15 um and so we mostly walked at various points, um, traveled in kind of fake compartments of trailers um, for hours. And then that would lead us to a different destination at times in vans. Um, and then we crossed the border in Tijuana and um, were documented in LA for about 10 years. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 the prior presentation talked about the refugee status and all that. You know, theoretically, theoretically, by international law, people fleeing for their life from El Salvador were refugees. Practically speaking, experientially, 
existentially, we are, we were, and we could discuss the category of refugee and the good and the limitations of it, but nonetheless, it means that theoretically, we, we um, needed international protection from our own government. Um, of course, the US government refused to recognize Salvadorans as refugees because the United States government was funding the war that was displacing, forcibly displacing the people. Well, that's an awkward situation to be, to both acknowledge that you are by the millions displacing the people of the country that you're funding a war with. Um, you know, it's, it's this kind of paradox. And of course it did not serve the US political interest to recognize Salvadorans as refugees. Um, one of the great things is part I mentioned, I didn't mention this yesterday, the sanctuary movement in the 1980s when churches sued the government uh, in eight, 1986, um, that lawsuit led to a settlement, the ABC settlement um, in 1991. And that allowed hundreds of thousands of cases to be revisited because the US government had adjudicated um, unfairly all of those cases. And they agreed. I mean, they literally kind of agreed that, all right, we'll revisit them. And I bring this up only to say, when governments fail to do their job, either by domestic or international policy or, or, or laws, it is up to basic communities, and I will say basic um, faith communities, to uphold that vision of humanity, even when the government fails to do so. And in the 1980s, the sanctuary movement was a key way of doing that. I'll stop there for now. I know I've kind of woven a lot there. I try to tie a bit with the previous presentation. Um, you know, I will guess I'll add one more thing. I, I now teach theology at Fordham University. I work with migration. My research is on churches and that provide sanctuary, transnational violence. I worked at the US-Mexico border, both with Palestinians and with Jews who work for migrants, uh, displaced persons arriving from Central America. This is a global network. And in fact, some of the leaders, and I may you know John Fife, some of the leaders from the borderlands are in constant communication with uh, the situation in the Mediterranean in Europe, with refugees and in other parts of the world, in Germany as well, because we're, we, these connections are happening much more now. The, what is the expertise in this part of the world that we need in this part of the world? What can we learn from there? What do you have to share? How have you worked around this law? This is one of the wonderful um, elements about the globalized world we live in. I mean, one of the few perhaps, it's this ability to communicate uh, and to share the expertise for the local grassroots um, kind of creative imagination uh, beyond the borders of nation states. So I'll end with that. Thank you for sharing your testimony with us, Leo. And this is precisely the reason why I wanted to bring your voice to this space, because if you, if, if you know, the attendees think about it now, if when they think about the issue of TPS, right? We talk about supporting TPS holders and um, in, in their struggle to, to not only keep it, but hopefully get residency, right? And, and with a pathway to, towards citizenship. Now we're gonna see this issue from that root cause, right? That addresses the fact that the US supported a, a war, like fuel that war that displays them to begin with. And, and didn't even acknowledge the war, of course, as Leo explained, um, because you know it, it was going to be yeah, not ideal. But people who were fleeing El Salvador had the right to get the refugee status, right? And so, but they didn't. And now look at them after all these years, still struggling to remain in their communities because now they, these are their communities, right? This is home for many folks. And so, so this displacement and this type of displacement um, that is partially fueled by US foreign policy needs to be addressed by people who live in the US, right? Us here. And so for me, it has become really, really important to, to bring into these spaces, these voices that talk about um, the the reasons why people migrate. Not only certain solutions that we we are working towards um, locally at the state level, nationally, um, and even internationally. Um, but but what, when are when is this going to stop? We need to stop advocating to stop every single deportation.
right? If 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 there was a um, an, a reckoning with the fact that a lot of these conditions have been fueled by U.S. foreign policy, then I think the approach would would be much different, right? It wouldn't be what I call actually condescending um, charity, but it would be justice, and that's a completely different lens, right? When approaching things. Um, and I, I want to make this, as I mentioned, uh, participate uh, for folks to participate. And so I want to make sure that folks are able to ask their questions. Um, Sebastian Klemmer, I see your question here. I don't know. I think we, we might have answered it. Um, but also, if you have any anything else to add, um, that's great as well. No, not really. You you both did in your answer, so so thank you for that. All right, thank you. And Nahida, I see that you would like to add something here. Yes, I, you you mentioned that we should look at it from a different lens, and maybe the lens of justice. Unfortunately, in my experience, in the case of Palestine, and I've gone to the border on many occasions, part of some of our church uh, committees, the U.S. has done other things uh, on a uh, financial level, for example, a lot of Mexicans from Southern Mexico left their farms because the U.S. started a price war on corn. The price of corn went down so low that these farmers couldn't make a living, and so they had to leave their farms and they, they tried to, to come to the north, and of course, you know what happens at the border. So the, the government knows what justice is, but we talk with great line like uh, this is a country for all its people and everybody's created equal, et cetera, et cetera. But the government doesn't behave that way, unfortunately. So, and, and I think it's up to us to uh, try and as much as we can, prick the conscience of the leaders in our government. That's why I have to say thank you. It really doesn't. And um, I, I'd like to share this report of Migrant Roots Media also um, that addresses the, the plan of the Biden-Harris administration um, of, on Central America. And I put it in the chat there. You, when you get some time, you can go through it. It's, it's only eight pages, actually. There's some graphics included and whatnot, but it really addresses all the, 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 the different bullet points in the plan. Um, and it really talks, it brings a historical context to it because what we've also noticed is that a lot of the terminology that we've been using, such as root causes, addressing the root causes, um, are being co-opted, are being co-opted and really tergiversadas. Uh, they're being really like changed, right? In, 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 uh, to, to make people think that they, you know, they want to address the root causes, but what they're talking about is bringing more um, you know, foreign investment, which we know that is, you know, ransacking country, uh, entire countries, entire populations, um, displacing indigenous communities and whatnot. You know the story here, your Pax Christi members. Um, uh, so, so how are we, how are we also looking into that narratives, terminology? Like, let's not, let's make sure that we, uh, dig deeper into what they're talking about, what they mean, and make sure that they're not co-opting um, terminology, which we've seen happen. Um, Leo, I think you have a comment here. Would you like to mention it? Well, this was more for, for Bob because he wrote there about uh, the sanctuary churches in the 1980s and that his parish was involved. And I'm sure for anyone else that knows, um, part of my research now is to try to understand better what aids and what prevents uh, clergy or faith leaders, bishops, um, in the process of providing or hindering the provision of sanctuary. Uh, I said this yesterday in the presentation, Catholic churches are not really part of the movement, at least not publicly this time around. And this is not the movement at the scale of the 1980s, but it really is, you know, uh, Presbyterian churches, it's Episcopalian churches, it's some historically Black churches now. Um, but Catholics are, are, are absent, and I, I, I can talk at length about why that may be and so forth, but um, something I mentioned yesterday was uh, Episcopalian churches, for example, now provide insurance for sanctuary church parishes that want to do provide sanctuary, which is very creative. 
in any case, my comment there was just, uh, yeah, I'm happy to, uh, if anyone here provided or their parish provided sanctuary in the 80s or now, I'm happy to, uh, you know, have a talk if you're interested or willing. That's what that was about. But my, my goal is to continue to understand more kind of from an ecclesiological perspective, how we understand ourselves as church. Um, and I know that the easy way out is to say, well, that's illegal and we can't do that. And but we all know at the same time what is legal or illegal does not or ought not determine our response to the gospel. So it's much more complicated than simply saying legal or illegal. Um, and I think woven into that is how we actually understand what it means to be church. So. Thank you for that. Uh, Nahida. Uh, yes, I have a question uh, for Leo. Um, I noticed that again on the issue of Palestine, the, uh, the Presbyterian Church and, and now the United uh, Church of Christ, they're very involved, but uh, we have not succeeded as much with Catholic, local Catholic churches. Can you talk a bit about that? What, what in the structure of the Catholic Church in the United States keeps that from happening? You mean the U.S. Church being involved with Palestinian issues? Yes. Ah, gosh. Um, my, my quick answer is, I don't know. Um, you know, well, of course, I, I've been to Palestine a couple of times, um, and I'm connected with the De La Salle Christian Brothers of Bethlehem University. And, you know, the witness that they provide and the work that they do in the West Bank there, and, in, and primarily in, Beth, in Bethlehem, um, to me is uh, a great example of these connections, because that is really a ministry of kind of the U.S. Uh, De La Salle Christian Brothers there, uh, and there are other organizations, of course. So um, I, I think maybe one way of um, kind of uh, untangling this is, I don't know what the status of the USCCB or the bishops in relation to Palestine is, but in terms of religious orders, I would think that there is more engagement. And this to me maps on generally how the Roman Catholic Church often ends up working. Um, you do have the religious, and then, uh, this is a generalization, okay, so in case there's any, um, you know, uh, priests here from um, the diocesan priests, but generally, uh, if you're a religious order, you do have greater, perhaps, flexibility in terms of discerning with your superior where you're being called in terms of the gospel, witnessing, or Christian life, the following of Jesus. Sometimes I think it may be a little more difficult for a, a diocesan priest to have that conversation with the bishop if the bishop is not already there. Now, if the bishop is, I think, a prophetic leader and the U.S. church, this may be controversial for some, I don't know, it's Pax Christi, but the U.S. church, um, the bishops, some of us would say, um, really, uh, the, the, there's, there's a gap right now in terms of um, how the spirit is being understood or discerned or not discerned in relation not only to the rest of the Roman Catholicism um, in the United States, Roman Catholics, but in the rest, in relation to the suffering of the world. I mean, that may sound too political, but you know, we hear that a lot, like where are our bishops in leading? And we have those prophetic figures and we can probably count them in two hands also. So, this is why I say again, the parish for myself, but uh, Nahida, the parish is the basic building block of Christian community and Christian witness. My parish or your parish or anyone's parish can or congregation can connect to a parish somewhere else. You know, we used to call it twinning in the past, but we can make these relationships that then just echo out. Um, at the end of at the end of it, I, I don't I don't know what aids or prevents all this. To, to back to your question, um, I think more maybe this is my Latin American Christian based community kind of way of thinking. Um, do we have a group of some committed people here? Okay, is the spirit calling us to do something? Okay, let's start it and let it be fueled by um, this mystery that we call grace, um, and who knows what impact it may have. But I, so. I'll end with 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 that. I think it may have something to do with the structures of um, of the U.S. Church and the willingness to willingness. I don't know. Maybe lack of exposure, lack of experience with the global suffering that we're living through. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we have to mention that the influence that the leadership of the church in the U.S. has had of um, white supremacy, right? Um, the fact that uh, a lot of times uh, 
racialized communities are really not seen as a priority, honestly. Um, and instead, there's a huge amount of, and this goes beyond a Catholics, of Christians in the US who support Israel. And maybe Nahira, you have something to say about that, but this is something that, this is one of the reasons, honestly, why I think it's really important to bring this conversation to our, these spaces that are faith-based, right? Um, because it's not so much, um, missing numbers, what my, my understanding is the, the Jewish community here, but it's the Christian community. And um, so we need to really look at that Christian Zionism is so strong. Um, and it's mm -hmm. it really hasn't been addressed. Um, and, and these are conversations that uh, I, we're hoping will happen more and more. And that's the reason why connecting the dots here with you know the issue of, of global migration and forced displacement in general is so critical, right? Um, because that's a, a conduit, like that's a way to address that um, within our uh, faith-based spaces. Um, so I, I know we have uh, what a little less than thirty minutes probably, uh, and I want to invite folks to ask their questions because this is the moment. This is a completely different space where you don't get the sad stories of migration. These are the stories about addressing the root causes, uh, about uh, really digging deep and talking about what we can do, right? What we can do here. Um, one of the things that I think about is uh, how can we work towards keeping uh, candidates uh, and then elected officials accountable to, uh, to, to, to what, you know, what they're gonna do, their commitments on foreign policy. I don't think we tend to do that very often. It's all very US centric, US centric. But the fact is that US foreign policy affects the entire world, right? Um, and of course, wh how much, what's the percentage that they give to the UN, right? Is it 20% or something? Um, it's very large. So, and, and having that veto power means that, you know, for example, that resolution that, uh, the rest of the countries supported that um, to to try to stop the bombardment of, of Palestinian communities uh, didn't go through because the U.S. said no, right? And so how, how are we addressing this? Why are we not talking about it? Um, I see some comments from Bob and I would like to invite him to, to say, to talk about it, uh, about those comments if he likes. Okay, I can say just just briefly, I'll try to be real brief because we're short on time. But anyway, I mean, things are different. Our church out here to me seems dead. There's, I'm the only Catholic working on most of Pope Francis's deals, whether it's, it's, it's uh, sanctuary and immigrants. Where, I mean, you know, there's the only one, we've got a great immigrant community working here. I'm the only Catholic involved. We used to have 400 people here involved when it was pushed by our bishops. We used to have peace bishops. Now we've got people that are tied to the Republican Party and Donald Trump, and that is a problem. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Bob. And I don't know if uh, if, if any uh, any of you have any comments about that, Nahida. Um, in the case of Palestine, uh, the government of Israel has been extremely clever at using the Bible. And many Palestinian Christians feel that the Bible is our biggest enemy. In my case, I sometimes tell everybody, I wish I could just cut the Bible in half, throw out the Old Testament, or at least the first five books of the Old Testament, and forget about them. <laughs> and so I have had experiences when I have spoke to my church, uh, um, the uh, synod here, and I was quoted a verse out of Genesis. And if you criticize Israel, then you are cursed by God. So, and you mentioned Christian Zionism. Yes, that's a big, that's a big problem. And the, uh, to to uh, talk to what Baba was just saying, the uh, the uh, Donald Trump followers are very much against immigrants or anyone that doesn't look like them. And um, the the they're they're well. I'll stop there. I would say more. 
Could I jump in here with a comment? Because um, Nahida, you bring up, a, 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 I mean, such a, such a complex aspect uh, of, um, of what it means to be part of a faith tradition. You said, I wish I could just like cut the Bible in the first five books. Um, of course, I think of Naim Atik, who's a Palestinian theologian, uh, yes. who says like, no, like after reading a passage that we would read like in liturgy, this is not the word of God, you know? Yes. And he wants to be able to bracket some passages and say, like, this does not do justice, or this is not life giving for me, whether it's a, as a Palestinian or now as a, as a woman or whatever, all of the isms that we find woven into that. And I just wanted to say, um, of course, I mean, uh, the moment we start doing that, uh, it, this is debatable, of course. Uh, the way I deal with it with my students when I teach like intro to theology, and we, we spend quite a bit on the Hebrew scriptures, um, the First Testament. Um, how do we take all of this and recognize that it was so deeply woven also with the 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 understandings of the people of themselves of those by those who wrote it and and the patriarchy is woven within it yes. and that exclusivism is written within it and all of these other things we want to be able to say is this god or and um i know someone um um Let's see the um, oh I'm blanking on um, the name right now. I'll, I'll come back to another book. The way that she deals with um, Exodus, for example, like I would not want to get rid of Exodus, of course. Um, and yet, part of me wants to say I want to keep the first fifteen chapters of Exodus. It's all about liberation, but not the latter fifteen, which is all about occupation in some ways. Um, but that is so difficult. How do we hold that together? And when I think about, because I think of sanctuary in a similar way, like, or these responding to things that, where the law becomes enmeshed, or like our current national laws and so forth. And I said, well, how do we discern what this could mean now? Um, and I guess I'll just add one more thing about saying, uh, in the midst of all of the politicization of our faith and left and right, I, I, I keep reminding myself of something that Gandhi said, um, that we need to learn the art of dying. Um, and I think for us Christians, and I know that can be a very difficult thing depending on where we're located within history and the privilege or lack thereof that we have, but as Christians, what does it actually mean to constantly live in the shadow of the cross, to learn not to be afraid of death? And to allow that overcoming of that fear of dying and thus learning the art of dying to free us for, for the struggles um, that we have to engage in, the struggle for the other's life, um, regardless of the cost to the institutional resources that we currently have, to our local resources, and trusting in really that, that, that there is more than what we can see. And this is why I said earlier about grace and the Holy Spirit. I th really do think we have to think about uh, God when we think about church. And oftentimes we fail to actually bring in God and we just focus on the institution of the church. And the moment we separate the two, we're no longer talking about the church of Christ. Um, and I, this is kind of how I deal with these very complex, this is all in short, of course, but how do we navigate this left, right, what to do, um, almost not map it onto politics too quickly. And just say like, who are we? What is it that we're called to? Um, if I actually choose to be part of this faith tradition, um, and how do I wrestle with these very, very um, violent texts um, that also have the potential for liberation? Thank you, Leo. I feel like that's um, that's really what drives me to dig deeper into my own ancestry. Um, the cosmovision of the indigenous people of this side of the world, uh, who actually uh, were in community with their death and had a very different relationship uh, with um, the Los Muertos. Uh, so, you know, how do we also uplift and, and, and maybe we don't have texts because, you know, a lot of things um, were destroyed when the invasion happened. However, I, I really do believe that they, there are memories in, in our bodies. Um, and somehow I think we can get them back. I, I really think that that could happen um, in various ways. Um, so that's a whole other conversation maybe, but 
um, how do we embrace uh, death, right? And, and, and start looking at all the options that we have, the fullness of, of what we have, like the, 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 do things end or not? I'm just going on a tangent now, but um, we have 15, 14 minutes left and I see a lot of comments on the chat and I really would like folks to unmute themselves and, and mention them and just, um, yeah, if you would like, I see Mary Ellen here. <laughs> Maybe you have more to add to that comment. If you wanna unmute yourself. I also see uh, Diana, Nancy Small, whoever would like to unmute themselves. If you can, or do I? Yeah, I think you can. You can do that in this setting. Because otherwise, oh, there we go, Nancy. So my question, I guess it'll be primarily towards you, Leo, but um, others. But uh, Pax Christie was saying this historical <laughs> grassroots movement, and I'm wondering what what can we learn from the Christian-based community movement that would help us at this moment. Um, reinvigorating or invigorating or creating uh, uh, um, these Christian kind of base or these base communities or basic communities uh, that go beyond Christianity, perhaps, um, you know, in other parts of the world, um, they are just like basic human communities in order to, to bring in more of, I'll keep referring to the spirit, more of what the spirit is doing beyond the Christian church, um, which I think invites us to go deeper into who we are as Christians and out of that tradition. Um, I felt that in the US, we really have a, a, a kind of a, a rather um, poor history of Christian-based communities at the parish level. Um, and you need people with a vision, you need bishops, you need clergy with a vision for saying, no, everyone here ought to belong or should belong or another word there to a small community where you all discern together. Um, I think that is those are the embers out of which all of these, um, you know, radically different uh, ways of moving forward arise. And then it's a matter of, you know, Pope Francis is saying is synodality. Then it's a matter of discerning collectively where, where it's a bigger community being called, but allowing it to kind of bubble up from these very small, like, you know, 10 people group. I, and when I did border work, um, I was both at the, working with a bishop down there, Bishop Econis, but then also I, I was employed by a parish and um, I worked into inter, interfaith. We had um, Just Faith was a, an organization and uh, we ran Just Faith groups. We ran like two or three a year. And at the end of five years or so, there had, there were hundreds of well-educated Catholics in friendship with non-Catholics fighting for similar things and building coalitions, but they had a theology upon which to ground their work, their political work, their justice work. And I think it's being able to locate that, as I said, within scripture, within theological frameworks that allowed for them not to be easily pigeonholed into, well, that's just a left, or, you know, that's just a political thing. Um, they could navigate, I think, um, in more nuanced ways, like why we need to stand here, even if it brings us like against the law or something, or in conflict with a bishop or something like that. Um, but they they could they could speak out of their tradition. Um, so I don't know uh, what role Pax Christi can play in, in even you know moving that further. But uh, um, I, I I've found it difficult to belong to small faith communities in the U.S. Um, just not part of the culture in, in many ways. I'm not sure why. I have to add, uh, that's one of the goals of Pax Christi uh, USA, to try to become a, a, not only a spiritual home, but also a political home for folks. Um, we see a lot of um, Catholics that uh, ha have left, I guess. I don't know a better way to say it, uh, or don't practice. Um, although I don't really think, but anyway, you're still Catholic. Um, but 
so you know a space where they where we can pray together study together and act together right and that's the reason why we started the um, love is political which is which are which is the literary circle uh where we read uh olga segura's book whom we spoke with last night um and it's um it's 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 something that we would like to expand, right? To not only do at the national level, but also to um, try to incorporate at the local level. Um, so we have, you know, chapters everywhere. We're hoping to have chapters in every state um, in the next year or two. And so far, I think we have, well, Lauren is here to correct me, um, maybe 30 something chapters. Um, so we're growing and we are trying to organize in a way that it really becomes, it, we're able to become that, that home that, you know, Leo just mentioned, right? Like it's hard to find in the U S and I, I would dare say in other countries as well, unfortunately, um, it's, it's going towards that direction. And that's quite scary because in Latin America, there's of course the tradition of comunidades de base. And which are no longer right. Uh, are, are probably you know very few. Um, but so how do we bring that uh, tradition, bring um, that type of organizing into into our spaces? And Nancy, you used to be the ED of Pax Christi USA, so really glad to have you here. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, many many moons ago. Yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> But it was a time too, like like uh, Bob had said, when we had some peace bishops, and um, it was a little easier in, in many ways to, uh, or at least there were churches that were much more about uh, gospel nonviolence and peace work, and so I think it was a different moment. So I, I I I applaud the work you're doing to try to you know revitalize that that part of Pax Christi USA. I think it's very important. Thank you, thank you, Nancy, and thank you for being here. I also see a comment by Joan, and we have seven minutes to, to address maybe this last uh, thought. Um, Joan, would you like to, to unmute yourself? There we go. Yes, hello to everybody. Thank you for all that you've presented and, um, and the wisdom and uh, time and commitment that you've made with your life and your life story and bringing it to us and giving it life with us, within us, and challenging us as, as elders uh, to try to get back to a place where there at least is more church support, and then go even beyond that, uh, which is what you most most of you are challenging us to do. But uh, whenever I'm at Mass and I hear, of course, the, the Old Testament readings that uphold Israel as the chosen people, the chosen one, the chosen land. I think I look at all the people on the pair and there's within the pews, and I think, how much does, does this undergird the whole uh, rationale that Israel is, you know, you, you, over, there's just this overwhelming political support for today's Israel, and um, including which includes its attacks and destruction and theft of Palestinian homes and properties. And there doesn't seem to be a moral will among the Catholic leadership to challenge the situation. And it just gives me great, great uh, grief. And, um, and it's true about uh, the other countries as well, you know, challenging uh, how, as you've, we've said, and uh, you're very clearly naming the situations of why people are leaving their countries or are forced to leave their countries. So, um, uh, Anyway, it's just a, 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 a just a deep sense of grief that I have about the Catholic us as Catholics and, and even listening to those readings and and then of course the most of the pastors don't um, elucidate that and, and say why it was used or and so on and reinterpret it as what we need to be thinking of today. And uh, I'm sure it's because they're, you know, they're afraid to touch uh, anything that would be dealing with Israel. And uh, we need to confront Israel. We need to confront ourselves about Israel and other countries, of course, and our own country. So anyway, those are just some of my thoughts. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, John, for what you said. And uh, this is an issue I think a great deal about, about it. 
I, I think uh, as you were talking, it occurred to me one difference between, let's say, the Presbyterian Church and maybe the Catholic Church, and I may be wrong there since I don't know the Catholic Church very well. In the Presbyterian Church, we have a, we have a way of uh, bringing up issues and meeting as a whole church, uh, U.S. church, and uh, we have these general assemblies every two years. We bring up uh, motions to be talked about, and, and we, we agitate and we pass them, or sometimes we don't pass them. And for the last 10 years, things issues on Israel have been falling more towards being pro-Palestinian. But I don't see that structure in the Catholic Church in the United States, which I think makes it more difficult. Mm -hmm. and, and, and yes, I think the Israeli government has used the Bible very expertly to try and, and pique people's uh, sympathy for, for Israel. And this idea of being a chosen people, so many people who are on top, for example, in South Africa, the Afrikaners thought of themselves as the chosen people. And Hitler thought, thought of himself as the chosen person. So people who are in power, I think, uh, might easily fall into the trap of thinking that they are chosen people and they are therefore looked on their noses at those they could deem to be in a lower caste than they are. And that's one thing as, as, as Christians, we need to really ask ourselves deep down and see what we can do about it. Yeah. And even Trump said he was the chosen one. Yeah. It's, that's that's the whole thing so about sad. QAnon, right? That's the the conspiracy yeah. theory around that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we yeah. should, you know, also uh, what's it? Manifest destiny here. So that too. Yes. 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 There's uh, definitely that that approach. In and the reason why you know uh, 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 these groups feel that it's okay to go and you know quote unquote civilize others. Um, because of course their ways have worked so well and the 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 uh, forests are not on fire um, <laughs> and the icebergs are not melting right it has worked so well to be so civilized um, so clearly we need to um, uh, look again at what we need to do and how we need to address and how we need to live and how we need to live in community right and address issues um, so, uh, oh, I see that. Fred, would you like to make a comment, Father Fred? Yes, please. Um, I just, uh, to Leo, I just want you to know that when I was pastor of Crystal Ray Catholic Church in Lansing, Michigan, about four years ago, we declared ourselves a sanctuary church and uh, we ignored the bishop who encouraged people not to do that. And, um, but we went through about a three year process. And I think this is one of the things that's important, we went through a three year process of dialogue within the church itself because we were 90% Hispanic. And many of the Hispanics themselves were afraid of us declaring our church a sanctuary church because of possible what they thought might be repercussions, might put a spotlight on, on, um, on them as uh, undocumented immigrants and that kind of thing. And, uh, but also the other thing we did is we tied in with Gamaliel Foundation and did a lot of community organizing work. And I think that's one of the keys too to, to dealing with these questions to really be about the business of community organizing. So I just wanted to add that comment at this point. Great, no, thank, thank you. And I'll just emphasize the discernment. I mean, can every parish do its own discernment without being shut down in that discernment? And this is, you asked earlier about Nahida, about the, what bishops or the US church think. So often it's, you can't discern. You know, you cannot have that honest conversation. That is shutting down the Holy Spirit from my theological perspective. That is, um, no, that, that's, a, that's really contrary to our faith. Now, a parish may discern not to do it, and that's their decision. Um, yeah, so I just want to emphasize the sermon there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And we have about two minutes. Uh, so I definitely want to encourage, encourage folks to look into this issue uh, of root causes of global migration uh, and really use that lens, use that internationalist lens, uh, that approach, because it will, it will help you see uh, migration in a different light and, and really promote uh, changes that will impact communities in, in completely different ways. Um, so I hope I hope this space was helpful to to do that. I am so thankful for uh, Nahida Halavi Gordon and Leo Guardado for being here and um, sharing their their testimonies to to enlighten 
our group and promote reflection, right? And to and we're gonna keep at it. We are hoping to we're actually working on creating a, a working group on um, to support the Palestinian Palestinian liberation. And so, if you are interested, we are going to be sending some information about how to join. Uh, we're hoping to also put together other working groups, one that looks into migration as well, specifically. Um, and we're in the month of October, we're going to be supporting mothers with uh, disappeared children who are going to be going through Mexico and then through the US. So we're hoping to organize uh, different events around the, the country uh, to support these mothers who are talking about the issues uh, of uh, the, their children who have disappeared and of course, link it to root causes.